So why did Scotland really give up its statehood? Well, the version of history that you've heard probably goes something like this. Following the failure of the Darien scheme to successfully establish a colony in Panama during the late 17th century, Scotland was essentially a bankrupt nation. Luckily, England stepped into the fray and rather generously agreed to bail Scotland out, albeit with a few terms and conditions of course, including abolishing its parliament and submitting to London rule, all standard practice. Nothing out of the ordinary. Er, uh, no. The reality is actually rather more nuanced. Firstly, while the Darien scheme had attracted thousands of ordinary Scottish citizens to invest a huge proportion of the nation's available capital, it had largely been privately funded. Thus, whilst the collapse of the scheme had proved to be a huge financial blow to the nation, it had largely affected the people of Scotland rather than the state itself. Thus, while Scotland had a national debt of only £160,000, England by comparison had a national debt of £18 million. The collapse of the Darien scheme was certainly a factor in Scotland's decision to sign the Treaty of Union, but it was not the only factor. Indeed, in many respects, it was merely the straw that broke the camel's back. In the five decades prior to 1707, England passed a series of acts that had a devastating effect on its relations with Scotland. These acts harmed not just Anglo-Scottish trade and Anglo-Scottish interests, but even the Union of Crowns itself. It all started with the English Navigation Acts of 1660 and 1663, which classified Scotland as a foreign country and thereby excluded Scottish ships from trade with the English colonies. These two acts were a key factor in the failure of the Darien Scheme. Then, in 1701, England passed the Act of Settlement in response to the failure of Queen Anne to produce any surviving children. It was decreed by England that the crown would pass to the German House of Hanover before Anne's death. Scotland, however, had not been consulted and in response passed the Act of Security in 1704, ensuring that it reserved the right to choose its own successor to Queen Anne. The Union of Crowns had essentially come to an end. Yet alienating Scotland on the high seas and driving a coach and horses through the Union of Crowns was not enough in itself to force Scotland to abandon its statehood. What was needed was a much firmer push, a move that would force it to submit to political union with England. This materialised in the form of the Alien Act of 1705, which led to an embargo on Scottish products being imported into England and its colonies, and curtailed exports from England and its colonies to Scotland. Further provisions in the Act classified Scots living in England as being aliens, in other words, foreign nationals, and asserted that estates held by Scots would be treated as alien property, something that made inheritance uncertain. Looking through the lens of history, it's clear to see that England had engineered the dismantling of the Union of Crowns and had systematically alienated its closest ally with the aim of forcing it to submit to a political union. This was not two states voluntarily coming together for the betterment of both. Rather, it was a larger state forcing its smaller neighbour to submit to a political union for its own benefit. It was in short a takeover, not a merger. International law states that nothing can be done without or against the will of a sovereign state. With this in mind, it is worth recapping that England, the nation calling for political union with Scotland, had in the years leading up to 1707 implemented the following measures against Scotland decreed that Scottish ships were to be considered foreign and forbidden from trading with England's colonies, blocked all imports from Scotland, resulting in Scotland losing half of its export market, curtailed many exports from England to Scotland, unilaterally passing legislation relating to the monarchy despite being in a union of crowns with Scotland, reclassifying Scottish citizens and their property in England as alien, removing in the process many of the rights they previously enjoyed. Let's also keep in mind that the above measures were implemented by a country that had shared a monarch with Scotland since 1603 and was supposedly an ally of Scotland. Things of course were done differently in the past and the point here is not to question the validity of the treaty, 
Yet that does not stop us from asking whether given the circumstances under which it was signed, Scotland should have the right to revoke the treaty, or at least redraft the treaty on equitable terms. Nowadays the concept of sovereign equality of states is a foundational principle in international law. States are deemed equal just by their status as states. States therefore are considered equal regardless of their geographical size, their population size, the size of their economy, their military power, or their level of industrialization. So for example, a tiny state like Luxembourg is considered an equal under international law to the United States. This is of course an example of modern international law, and whilst it would be hard to argue that Scotland and England were equal signatories of the Treaty of Union, we have to accept that it was signed in a time when smaller nations did not have the protections that are available today. The Permanent Court of Arbitration, for example, came into being almost two centuries after the Union, in 1899, whilst the International Court of Justice was founded even later in 1945. Nonetheless, we live in a society today that is willing to try and right the wrongs of the past. Take slavery, for example, which was commonplace at the time the Treaty of Union was signed. These days, many historical statues and symbols associated with slavery have been removed worldwide. Scotland should at least have the right to have its historical wrongs rectified. And if this union is to try and claim to be in any way fair, then Scotland should have the right to revoke the treaty, if it so chooses, especially given the circumstances under which it was signed. After all, if England wanted to leave the Union, or perhaps more accurately, dismantle it, who could stop it? Neither Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland, whether separately or combined, could prevent England from leaving the United Kingdom. Yet whilst England is free to decide its own destiny and that of the Union, Scotland is essentially little more than a hostage of England's greater population. And when English politicians who have neither lived nor worked in Scotland continually dismiss Scotland's right to choose its own constitutional destiny, it shows just how insecure they are about the union they are forcibly trying to hold together.